morning, everybody. You are very welcome to join us on The Breakfast Show here on Sky News. Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng have already been forced into two U-turns on plans to abolish the top rate of income tax and the date of a major statement about the public finances. Now a new rebellion is growing among Conservative MPs over a planned squeeze on public spending and potential benefit cuts. Our political correspondent, Joe Pike, has been asking what's next at the Tory conference in Birmingham. What's the next U-turn, Chancellor? Are you going to be cutting the welfare budget next? Are you going to keep benefits as they should be in the line? The decision will be taken in due course and I'll really look forward to talking to you about it then. Thank you. The government should uh, uprate in line with inflation. Uh, the previous government said uh, it was going to, so people are expecting this. Is that the next battle, do you think? Well, I hope not, because I hope the, uh, the government has clearly started listening. But what about benefits, uprating benefits in line with inflation? Is that something you want to see? Well, I, I, of course, every, every politician would want to see that. If there is a case whereby uh, we are going to be you know, going through difficult times, then the government must communicate that and be honest with people and explain how and what needs to happen next. Well, there's always fat to trim uh, and uh, there, there is considerable wastage in government. That's a, a sad reality. Uh, identifying it and then uh, getting rid of it without uh, cutting essential services is the real challenge. To the Justice Secretary, Brandon Lewis, in just a moment or two before that, let's have a look at what's happening as far as the papers are concerned. The Financial Times reports that after his tax U-turn, the Chancellor will shift on the timing of his debt slashing plans. In further U-turn fallout, The Guardian says emboldened rebel Tories are gearing up to block reductions in public spending, particularly benefits. According to The Times, former Home Secretary Priti Patel will fire a conference broadside warning the Tories will live or die by their economic credibility. The Mirror calls it a calamity conference and says that regardless of the tax U-turn, the damage is done. While the Daily Mail exclaims, get a grip, the Express strikes a positive tone with a call from Liz Truss for readers to stick with her and a promise to reward their trusts. As promised, the Justice Secretary and Lord Chancellor Brandon Lewis is with us this morning. Good morning, Mr Lewis. Thank you for joining us on uh, the programme. The U-turn yesterday, high rate of tax. Um, on the face of it, it does appear that it was there to appease backbenchers like Michael Gove. You wouldn't have got it through the Commons if there'd been a vote on it. Um, what's the point in having convictions if you cave on them at the earliest opportunity? Well, we also regularly have a situation where people criticise politicians for not listening. And I think what you've seen is the Prime Minister and the Chancellor listening to what they heard, not just from colleagues, but more widely as well, recognising uh, the issue and the challenges with the 45p decision and therefore saying, look, we've got a big package here, a package about growth, a package helping the most vulnerable in society. That's what we want to focus on. This has become a distraction. We've heard, we've listened, we get it, and that's why they've removed it. And I think, actually, look, you know, as politicians, listening to people is what we, we're expected to do, and I think it's right that we've done that. OK, so there could be more mini-budget U-turns then? Well, I think the rest of the budget, and the whole point is we've got 95% of the budget is going forward that uh, Kwasi Kwarteng outlined. It's about growth. It's about helping the most vulnerable in society. It's arguably the biggest package to support people on energy that we're seeing pretty much in the Western world and certainly across Europe. And we want to focus on that, and I, th I, th I think it's right that that's what we do. So is that ruling out U-turns or not? Well, look, as I say, in, in government, you're always looking at what you can do, what you can do better, what you can deliver better for people in, in, in the future. But I think we've got a package that is a, a strong package. It's a package that says to the world that the UK is open for business. So I think we will deliver the rest of that package as it is. Um, it says, as I say, to the world that we're open for business, that the UK is a place to invest, that it's competitive globally at a tax level that encourages business, who are domestic businesses, to grow and employ more people and international businesses to come here and, and join the UK economy and, and grow their business here as well. That's good yeah. because it doesn't just employ more people, it means more tax to improve public services further in the future. OK, so you say getting through the rest of the 95% of the package as it is. In an interview this morning, six times the Prime Minister apparently has refused to rule out further uh, U-turns. Was her determination to get this through? 
Well, I think she has got determination to get this through. Look, what we've seen with the Prime Minister already is somebody who she outlined during the leadership campaign, the core principles she stands for. That's what we're delivering. It's what we're still focused on delivering, which is a lower tax, high growth economy, moving our country forward to be able to create the jobs and higher wages for people in the future and to see growth go back to a, a real a growth level that we all recognise as growth, trying to get to that 2.5%. We've had a very, very long time of uh, s s stability that's meant lack of growth and that is not good for the economy. We need to do something different. Uh, what the chance and the Prime Minister set out is a different pathway. I think it's a pathway that will deliver the growth we want to see. That is good for the whole country. It means everybody in this country is going to have uh, the ability to earn more money. They're going to have a tax cut for around 30 million people in the period ahead of, as a result of the announcements we made. That also means that there is more money through the tax that we get when people spend money, when people earn money, when businesses invest, when businesses grow. All of that goes in to help fund our brilliant public services. Yeah, you're saying get through this economic plan as it is. The Prime Minister is ruling, uh, six times uh, not ruling out a further U-turn. Is she talking to her Cabinet? Oh, well, look, I talk to the Prime Minister regularly, actually, and obviously we had a Cabinet conversation just a couple of days ago. So, yeah, she does talk to the Cabinet. And what's really good about the Prime Minister, I have to say, and my experience in the early weeks of being in this job, is that she trusts her Secretaries of State to get on and run their departments. The Chancellor trusts us to get on and run our budget. That's how we can get things done. It's how in the Department of Justice we've already been able to expand our tagging programme, as we announced just a few days ago. Uh, we're looking at what more we can do to support vulnerable people, particularly women who are involved in rape and sexual offences uh, cases going through the courts, getting our court backlog down and trying to make sure we've got a package there that can end the strike that we're seeing with criminal barristers to get justice to people more quickly. I can do that because the Prime Minister's put the trust in me as a Secretary of State to deliver it. Yeah, but you didn't know, as, as did all the rest of the Cabinet, <coughs> about the, the slashing of 45p down to 40p until it was actually announced. The Prime Minister told us that herself um, last week. Um, when did you know about the U-turn in this top rate of tax? Well, look, two things, Kay. <clears throat> First of all, decisions that are made and announcements that are made as part of budget are often, and generally are, I have to say, my experience has been in Cabinet for <laughs> a few years now, um, are kept uh, to the Chancellor because they're not only market sensitive, uh, but they should be announced to, to Parliament first. And there's market sensitivity around some of these things. So actually, I think that's quite a, a normal and common process. Uh, I got a phone call very early on uh, Monday morning about the change to, to, to remove the 45%. As I say, I think where something like that's become a distraction from a phenomenally positive and a big package to help people across the country, I think... I can absolutely see why the Chancellor and the PM have done it and I support them in looking at what we are doing to deliver for people across the country. OK, it's not just Grant Shapps, it's not just Michael Gove that are um, scratching their claws. Nadine Doris, who used to be the Culture Secretary, she's also been tweeting saying widespread dismay at the fact that three years of work has effectively been put on hold. No one <coughs> asked for this. Um, she, wants, uh, she thinks that there should be a new mandate for this government. Um, which would, in other words, mean uh, an election. Do you think that's a good idea? Uh, look, no, I think the public have had... We've had a lot of general elections in a very short period of time, and I think we, we've got a couple of years to the next general election. I think the public want to see us, particularly at a difficult time. We're going to, let's be frank, we are going to go into a very difficult winter for people. That's why we've put this substantial package uh, to protect people from even further challenges with energy prices, particularly, in place. I think people want to see us get on and deliver on that job. That's how we uh, ensure that at the next general election we can win. I think we can win, I have to say. And I remember general elections in the past, people telling us we were going to win with massive majorities in 2017 and that didn't happen. I remember being told in 2015 we were going to lose and obviously we won that election. So uh, the, the polls are a snapshot in time. We as colleagues have to be focused on what we're doing to deliver for people. And I have to say I'm at conference. Uh, I was back in London yesterday morning for the opening of the legal year but on Saturday, Sunday and yesterday evening when I was here with the members I've seen a really positive um, uh, sort of atmosphere around conference of people wanting to get on with this and deliver for people. OK, the Prime Minister writing in The Telegraph this morning saying, I want to bring the public with me. I want to win hearts and minds because I really believe my plan is the right one for the country. Less than two weeks ago, she was telling our Beth Rigby um, that she was happy to be unpopular. Does she no longer believe in herself? Well, she does, and I think the two things actually are a complementary point. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, look, what the Prime Minister has outlined is, look, there are difficult decisions, the things we have to do to move the economy, to change the way we're doing things. 
it will change. Uh, can, can have disruption and this is a big change in how we deal with economic policy in this country in the sense that although we will obviously ensure that we remain fiscally responsible and the Chancellor's outlined that and he's got his Orpington statement on the 23rd of November which will set out that medium term plan that people want to see but also making sure we do move to a lower tax economy that can drive growth and what okay. the Prime Minister I think is rightly saying is that she does want to uh, show people why that is the right thing to do but she is prepared to do the difficult things and in government that is sometimes the job we have to do for the right reasons. And does that stretch to capping a rise in benefit payments to average earnings rather than inflation? Which would be a difference between, I suppose, well, I think, five um, and a half and ten percent, so half as, uh, half as much. Well, I think we're getting into conjecture. There's, there is a process around this. The Department of Work and Pensions, Chloe Smith, the Secretary of State, works through that. Over the autumn, she will make some announcements around that. I'm not going to prejudge what that will be, but what I would say to people before people um, get too concerned about this is we've got a track record as a government for many years, right through COVID and most recently in this package that the Chancellor announced, of doing everything we can to protect the most vulnerable boy in society. That has been a driving force for this government. We've done that consistently. Uh, I know the Prime Minister is focused on ensuring that we are still doing everything we can to protect the most vulnerable people. But, as I say, the benefits structure is one that goes through a proper process. We've got to let that process happen, and the Work and Pension Secretary will speak to that in the near future, during yeah. the autumn. I mean, it wasn't a conjecture, because I wasn't making a statement. I was asking a question. Do you think that uh, oh, no, I we appreciate could see that. benefit Look, no, payments? No, I, I, yeah, absolutely. But, but what, what I mean is people are wondering about what will happen with the uh, benefits structure and, and what the changes will be, if there are any, um, is something that goes through a proper process. The decisions around that okay. are something the Work and Pensions team work through. and They will make an announcement through the course of the autumn, but we've got to let them do that work first. What I'm saying for people, though, is the underlying principle with this government has had consistently through challenges, whether it's the Ukraine war, COVID, uh, has been to protect the most vulnerable in society. That's why we're seeing those people getting £1,200 benefit, actually, through no, the announcements that the Chancellor made just a couple of weeks ago. Sure, but should benefits rise with inflation? Sorry, Kay, I lost you there. Yeah, no problem. I was just asking whether benefits, in your opinion, should rise with inflation. Well, that's tempting me into prejudging the decisions and the no, it's discussions. Not. I'm asking your opinion, uh, Justice Secretary. Well, no, well, it has, because every, the problem is we're, when we're in the Cabinet, we all have collective responsibilities. So it's not just my opinion when I'm speaking, I'm speaking on behalf of the government. I'm going to let the Work and Pension Secretary do her work. I do want to make sure, and I am very supportive of the work we've always done as a government, as I say, which is protecting the most vulnerable in society. OK, given that you're a member of the Cabinet and collective responsibility, you would expect to be involved in that decision making? Uh, well, I have to say, all these things tend to get discussed through Cabinet. There is a, there's a difference with market-sensitive things around the budget. That's always been the case through consistent Cabinets. Uh, but all of these things are things that go through Cabinet, yes. OK, but then um, if you do decide that it needs to be with average earnings rather than um, inflation, then you've got those big beasts that can't be tamed, like Michael Gove and Grant Shapps again, who've already made their position um, clear. Um, and the Prime Minister might find herself in another damaging U-turn. How much do you think that is in the back of her mind when she's making policy decisions now? Well, I've got to say, my experience of working with the Prime Minister, she tends to focus on what is right for the country and what is going to get the best outcome for people right across our country. Uh, look, we do work in a parliamentary democracy. That means we have to work with Parliament. We've got to make sure that what we are doing uh, can pass in Parliament as well. That's just a reality of a, a parliamentary democracy. Uh, look, I saw, I, I heard the, a, a clip from what Grant was saying to you earlier, and Grant was making the point, even with welfare benefits, it's about making sure that whatever you do, you're clear about what the argument is, that you can uh, show people why what you're doing is the right thing. As I say, with Quasi's budget, it was one part of that. We, need, we, we could have rolled the pitch better. We've been open about that. That's why we've moved that away. With the welfare system, as I say, the team at the Department of Wel uh, Work and okay. Pensions and Chloe Smith, the Secretary of State, are working through that at the moment, and they will be making a statement on that this autumn. But these are not junior MPs. These are people that were sat around the Cabinet table with you until a month ago, um, not necessarily with Michael Goes, but certainly as far as Grant Shapps is concerned. You have to take their um, views and opinions into account, surely? Well, one of the things I'm sure that the, the team will be doing is looking at a couple of things. One is, obviously, people are always going to be listening to what's out there. We've shown, actually, in the last few days, the Prime Minister's shown that she is listening to people. That's why uh, she's made that change with the 45p rate. So, yes, we do listen to people, but the team at the Department of Work and Pensions have also got to work through uh, the numbers to make sure that whatever they're proposing this autumn works for people, can deliver what people need, and, as I say, sticks by that uh, core principle of doing what we can to support the most vulnerable in society. Uh, there are suggestions that there is um, some fat to be cut out of um, departments in order to try to save um, some monies. Um, 
What would that mean for your department, given that there's a massive backlog in the court system? Oh, well, look, I think it's, it's something I know look, it's, a, it's a few years ago now when I was running businesses as well, but one of the things you're always doing business and one of the things I think is right and good that we do in government is always look at what can you do more efficiently, uh, where can you save money, both in terms of that means there's more money saved for the exchequer, that's good for the general public, or more money you can spend on other frontline services. So looking at how you do things more efficiently is, a, is good practice. Every business person in the country tends to do that and certainly it's a good thing for us to do in government. I'm certainly going to be doing that um, in my department. Uh, for example, looking at the court process Process this system. Yes, we've got a, uh, an unacceptable backlog. That's why I want to see an end to the criminal barrister strike. We've put forward a, a really strong positive package, which I hope they'll accept, so that we can start getting on top of that backlog. But there are other things we can do as well around how we modernise, how we use technology. Uh, we're doing some of that, for example, in making sure that for vulnerable women who are involved in uh, rape and sexual violence cases do not necessarily need to be in court. They can use technology and record their evidence separately. We're seeing with prisoners, rather than spending money, always moving them uh, between prisoners and courts. We're spending money to put technology in so that they can give evidence uh, from a secure room in prison as well. So there's a whole range of things we can do uh, and I will always be looking at how we do things more efficiently and effectively. That's part of my duty to the public and the people of Great Britain. It's keeping them safe and doing it efficiently. Uh, let's end where we started. Just to clarify, you uh, see a U-turn as a position of strength rather than weakness, despite a quote from a certain lady 40 years ago that still resonates today. Well, she's a great lady and she, uh, I was very fortunate. She uh, was the Vice-Chancellor of my university and gave me my degree. Uh, look, the reality is I think what's good is that the Prime Minister feels strong enough and confident enough to, to have listened to people, to make a decision, uh, to be able to move on and focus on this huge package of support we're putting in for people that will give not just tax cuts to 30 million people, but give that extra protection around energy prices and inflation to the most vulnerable people in our country. So U-turns are not a weakness? Look, I think sometimes when, you've, when, you de when you're develop developing policy and delivering policy, you've got to listen to people. I think uh, generally people criticise politicians for not listening. You've got a Prime Minister who has listened and the Chancellor has listened and they've acted. OK. That's it's great to talk to you as always. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Still to come on the programme for you. Does the government's economic strategy undermine national security? Talking to the Defence Committee Chair, that's Tobias Elwood. Political biographer Sir Anthony Seldon gives his take on whether the government can recover lost credibility. And as new polls show Labour maintaining commanding leads, that's over the Conservatives, we'll get analysis from pollster and Tory peer, Lord Hayward. North Korea has fired a missile over Japan, causing air raid sirens to go off in Tokyo. People across Japan were warned to take cover as the missile passed overhead before landing in the Pacific Ocean. Phoebe Amorosa is in Tokyo for us this morning. Hi, Phoebe, good to see you. Um, tell us more about what's happening. Well, it was a very alarming wake up call for Japan. And that's as North Korea's believed to have fired an intermediate range ballistic missile over the country. And this is the first time that. North Korea has fired a missile over Japan since 2017. It's also believed to be the longest test flight flying at around 4,600 kilometers. And this comes just after South Korean officials said last week that North has completed preparations for a nuclear test and could conduct one imminently. So we've seen a very strong uh, international response condemning Pyongyang's actions. Our Prime Minister Fumio Kishida here in Japan has called it outrageous. And Japan says that all options are on the table, and that includes counter-strike capabilities. And that would be a big step for Japan, which has a pacifist constitution. So that would really be beating up its defences. The US has also said it, it's, will, it's committed to its defence of Japan and South Korea, but has stressed that the door remains open for dialogue with North Korea. OK, um, good to talk to you. Uh, one or two technical issues, but we're certainly getting the sense of what you were telling us there. Uh, keep safe, Phoebe, thank you. Uh, now, Ukrainian troops have broken through Russian defences in the south and expanded their offensive in the east. Let's find out more, should we, Diana, standing by for us in Moscow uh, this morning. This is not going to be happy reading uh, in Moscow, is it, Diana? Good morning to you. 
Not really, especially, Heike, after um, the Ukrainians retook the city of Liman um, in the north, they've now made advances around Kherson in the south, that Kherson counteroffensive that's been telegraphed for a long time. Um, and also the Russians have been admitting to it. We've heard from the Kremlin-appointed head of the Kherson region that uh, they've taken several villages around Ordudichani, one particular village which is on the Dnipro River. And the Defence Ministry also confirmed that the Ukrainians had broken through the Russian lines just north of Dudchani and also just south of Kherson. And apparently the Russians had retreated and were uh, inflicting massive fire on the enemy, they said. But it's interesting to see the Defence Ministry acknowledging these kinds of losses and also to hear the reaction on military blogs, which have been very critical of these losses that the Russians have been sustaining, pro-Kremlin military blogs. And also increasingly on state TV, we're seeing much more frank discussion about the fact that this is a long and hard fight and that the Russians aren't doing particularly well, which obviously comes off the back of uh, all the sort of fanfare around the fact that mobilization wasn't really being managed particularly well. We've had Ramzan Kadyrov, the head of uh, the region of Chechnya, uh, lay blame on the commanders uh, who lost Liman and call for them to be, be replaced. And that's also from the, the head of the mercenary group Wagner, Yevgeny Prigozhin, has also uh, come out publicly and, and attacked the Russian command. Um, and there's also reporting today that, or last night in fact, that the leader, the, the commander of the Western Military District, in charge of Liman has been replaced um, by an, another. So a reshuffle at the Ministry of Defence just from one Russian source. We have that at the moment. I think the fact that you're seeing this kind of discourse on public channels suggests that, you know, it is not as tightly controlled as it has been. There could be two reasons for that. One is that people are just really worried and beginning to speak frankly in ways that we've not seen before, opening really a Pandora's box of criticism. The other, of course, is that it does prepare the public for an even more dire situation where Vladimir Putin can claim that he was compelled to use even more dire weapons, which is, of course, something that he has been threatening over and over again now. Um, his uh, new clear talk, his claims that he is not bluffing. And I suppose if state TV prepares the people for what they're calling a, 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 a Russian losses against not Ukraine, really, but a, a, a larger NATO, um, he could feel justified to claim uh, the need to use more deadly weaponry. OK, Diana, thank you. In other news, the Royal Navy is sending a submarine hunter to the North Sea to help protect oil and gas pipelines. The move follows the apparent sabotage of gas pipelines off the coast of Denmark, which some Western countries have blamed on Russia. Let's get more, should we? Emma standing by for us at the Ministry of Defence this morning. Hi, Emma, tell us more. Yes, yeah, so this ship has been sent to the North Sea to work alongside the Norwegian Navy. And according to the Ministry of Defence, is to provide reassurance for those working near the gas pipelines. However, I think what we can be clear about is that this is about more than reassurance. It's about also providing protection and also a sense of deterrent because uh, it's strongly thought that underwater explosives were used to cause the four leaks in the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines that run from Russia to Germany, huge volumes of methane escaping into the North Sea. And Russia has denied any involvement in that, instead pointing the finger at the West. But what has become clear and was made clear by Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, at the Conservative Party conference is that this has really flagged up the vulnerability of this kind of infrastructure, whether it's cables or whether it's pipelines, and that something needs to be done to provide protection. And yesterday, the Joint Expeditionary Force, which is made up of 10 northern European countries, got together and, and decided that they do need to increase the presence in the North Sea to act 
act as that kind of deterrent. And just one other thing to add, and that is that um, the Defence Secretary has also said that the UK will be acquiring two new kind of ships. They're called multi-role survey ships for seabed warfare. Now, one will be fitted out in the UK, available operation for operations by the end of next year, and another is also going to be built from scratch. And this all about ramping up this uh, protection for crucial infrastructure. OK, thank you. Looking at some of today's other headlines for you now, let's start with immigration. The Home Secretary will set out her plans to deal with illegal immigration later on today, with the government's controversial Rwanda deportation policy being challenged in the courts. Suella Braverman is expected to ask the French government to do more to stop small boats crossing the Channel and attempt to make deportations easier. The man charged with the murder of nine-year-old Olivia pratt Corbell will remain in custody until he faces trial in March. 34-year-old Thomas Cashman appeared at Liverpool Magistrates Court yesterday before the case was referred to the Crown Court. He's also charged with the attempted murder of Olivia's mother, Cheryl, and of Joseph Nee, the man he chased into their home. The inquiry into the UK's pandemic preparedness when COVID hit is due to begin later. The preliminary hearing delayed during national mourning for the Queen will outline the schedule of the inquiry and what it will investigate. Public hearings are due to start next spring. Looking at the weather for you now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Next few days will bring wind and rain, but southeastern Britain looks mainly fine and dry. Top stories for you so far this morning. The Justice Secretary, Brandon Lewis, has this morning told me the government will deliver the rest of its mini-budget as is, following U-turns on the top rate of tax and the timing of the next fiscal statement. However, the Prime Minister has refused to rule out further U-turns. Japan's Prime Minister has decried what he calls a reckless act after North Korea fired a ballistic missile over Japan and into the Pacific Ocean. Ukrainian troops have broken through Russian defences in the south and expanded their offensive in the east. Prime Minister says she's going to take a responsible approach to handling of public finances amid a fresh battle against Tory rebels over the level of benefits. Earlier, the Justice Secretary Brandon Lewis told me the Prime Minister is working for the benefit of the country, despite admitting the government could have rolled the pitch better on its mini-budget. My experience of working with the Prime Minister, she tends to focus on what is right for the country and what is going to get the best outcome for people right across our country. Uh, look, we do work in a parliamentary democracy. That means we have to work with Parliament. We've got to make sure that what we are doing uh, can pass in Parliament as well. That's just a reality of a, a parliamentary democracy. Uh, look, I saw, I, I heard the, a, a clip from what Grant was saying to you earlier, and Grant was making the point, even with welfare benefits, it's about making sure that whatever you do, you're clear about what the argument is, that you can uh, show people why what you're doing is the right thing. As I say, with Quasi's budget was one part of that. We, need, we, we could have rolled the pitch better. We've been open about that. That's why we've moved that away. With the welfare system, as I say, the team at the Department of Wel uh, Work and okay. Pensions and Chloe Smith, the Secretary of State, are working through that at the moment, and they will be making a statement on that this autumn. All right, let's carry on with the uh, cricket analogy tomorrow. Good morning. He always plays it with a straight bat, doesn't he? He always does, Kay, but I think even Brandon Lewis trying to be positive there um, couldn't um, really put a gloss on what has been a very difficult uh, Conservative conference and fresh from the massive U-turn yesterday on the decision to uh, cut the 45p rate of tax, which the government now concede uh, they got wrong. The problem with giving in is that then uh, the rebels then want more and it's clear that the next brewing rebellion is going to be about benefits and the decision which is expected uh, very soon in the next few weeks about whether to uprate them, to lift them by the level of inflation uh, from April next year. Rishi Sunak, as Chancellor, said that would happen, which would be about a 10% rise, but it looks as if uh, the government are now trying to get away with a lower rise, perhaps at the level of average earnings, which is about 5%, to save several billion 
pounds that they'll need to save in order to plug uh, the black hole created by some of these unfunded tax cuts. Now you've got Conservatives publicly saying and just this morning a cabinet minister Penny Mordaunt uh, said on the radio that she thought it was the right thing to do to lift benefits by the level of inflation uh, but uh, some in cabinet think that they can get away with not doing it and it looks like that may be the next big battle for Liz Truss and her Chancellor. What we also learned last night is that in another U-turn Kwasi Kwarteng who had a difficult day yesterday talking about a little turbulence he has decided to bring forward his plan to balance the books to tell us where that money is going to come from and what spending cuts will be required to this month. We'd heard it would be the end of November but he's now bringing it forward in order to give the market some reassurance. That does also mean that some of these decisions potentially including benefits will need to be made pretty swiftly so that we get a sense of exactly how much how much in savings the government will have to find. So it looks like a rocky road ahead uh, for Liz Truss and her Chancellor. Absolutely. The polls are terrible again this morning and I believe that the, the Prime Minister has been speaking to one of our colleagues. She's six times uh, refused to rule out um, a U-turn and then she's speaking to conference tomorrow. Yes, Liz Truss's big speech is tomorrow. Um, can she try to reset, try and rally support from her many uh, critics in the party? Uh, we'll see if she has uh, much chance of doing that. The mood here is quite grim. Although you've got ministers saying that she can, that they've had a terrible couple of weeks, that they understand that poll after poll after poll showing massive leads for Labour. They believe that they can uh, turn things around, that now Liz Truss has made that U-turn, she can concentrate on selling her plan to freeze people's energy bills, which they say is a sign that, as Brandon Lewis was saying there, that she is on the side of ordinary people. But I've also heard from veteran Conservatives, not just people who supported Rishi Sunak, including uh, people who supported other candidates, people who've been in the party for a very long time, saying they haven't felt this depressed in 35 years as one for former minister was telling me yesterday so look a big reassurance job is going to need to be done and I, what I'm hearing a lot from MPs is Liz Truss doesn't just have to apologise for what happened yesterday she needs to show she's learned from it so when she makes her next announcement which is uh, the benefits announcement is coming soon then you've got this big uh, package of what she calls deregulation measures to um, to save money on childcare, to shake up planning. They want to make sure those have been fully worked through and discussed with people first so there aren't any more nasty surprises for her MPs coming down the track. Yeah, and as far as the benefits are concerned, um, Tamara, just your take on that as well, if you would please. I mean, the difference between um, going with uh, average pay rises and going with inflation is double, isn't it, when it comes to benefits? Absolutely. Liz Truss has given an interview to LBC Radio uh, this morning in which she says, she sort of hints that she doesn't want to lift benefits by the level of inflation, saying that she promised to lift pensions during her leadership campaign by the level of inflation because it's more difficult for pensioners to get additional income. They really need that money from their pensions, whereas people on benefits can take on more hours or take on a different job. Now, I can tell you that some, some of her own ministers, including in the Cabinet, disagree with that and think that it's important to raise the level of benefits because people are going through such a tough winter. Because regardless of this freeze in energy bills, people are still going to be paying more on their energy bills than they were a year ago. So she's going to face a lot of opposition on this. It looks like Liz Truss is gearing up to say, let's lift benefits only by the level of average wages in order to save probably around £7 billion. I think that's the, the estimate that's been around uh, this morning. But she is going to face a revolt if she does not, if she's not able to bring MPs with her on that, then um, that will be another expensive commitment that she will need to find the money for. And when talking to people here about the prospect of austerity, the prospect of spending cuts, uh, they say they are worried that the public will not want to stomach them. And public services like the NHS, schools, the justice system simply uh, are, can't cope already uh, with the amount of funding that they've currently got. OK, for now, thank you. Thanks so much, Tamara. Uh, let's take a look at foreign policy now with the Defence Committee Chair, that's Tobias Elwood. Um, he is in Poland's capital, Warsaw. Um, hello to you, Mr Elwood. Thanks for joining us on the programme this morning. It looks as though uh, your government, first of all, has um, steadied the ship. I'm guessing that will go down well with our international partners. 
Uh, yeah, it's important that uh, the message from Birmingham is heard around the world. I mean, good government is all about wise policy making. It's about economic performance. It's about showing political competence. And that needs to be seen across the world. I'm pleased that the Chancellor recognised and confirmed that not everything fell into place and uh, we are now making amends. But, you know, high growth, that is key. That's the mission, absolutely. I mean, we've not had... Uh, good productivity in the UK since 2008, going back that far. So we need bold leadership. We need uh, risk-taking. We need uh, to challenge the status quo. But you have to do that by red-teaming your ideas, by communicating, by, by motivating. And clearly, there was no appetite for those high tax breaks when we've already borrowed £60 billion, pounds, rightly, to help pay the people with their energy costs. So I think it's so important that we get the communications right now so we can steady the markets, get the interest rates down, get our mortgages down. And should the Roman uh, Chancellor remain in post? Yes, I, I, we need to see here, here his fiscal statements in November. I would strongly encourage him to bring that forward um, so we have greater stability, greater understanding of what's going on. I think you just share some of those ideas behind the scenes beforehand. I know there's always a reluctance to do that. Let's also have that OBR report uh, as well. But also, I'd rather say, standing here in Warsaw, where we're discussing things in Ukraine, you can no longer write a budget without taking into effect the international headwinds that we face. We embrace globalization, but globalization is now on the retreat. You cannot write a budget without perhaps the National Security Council also casting their eye over the facts. You want to get inflation down in the UK, then let's get those uh, uh, grain ships from Odessa leaving that port on a more regular basis. That is the sort of thing that we need to be thinking about, not just a siloed approach to the UK. Um, you're in Poland rather than a Birmingham at Tory party conference talking about Ukraine and other uh, defensive uh, defence issues. Not least, I'm sure, uh, on your mind is the fact uh, that uh, North Korea have uh, been testing missiles over Japan's airspace. That is the absolute heart of what's been discussed here at the Warsaw Security Conference. What happens next? You know, we dithered when the invasion was likely to take place. We didn't make it clear what we would do. We should have actually prevented it by going firm uh, on standing up to Russia. And here we are again questioning ourselves what might or might happen, might not happen, uh, if Russia were to go down to use low-yield tactical nuclear weapons. They are starting to transport the equipment to the front line. We need to have a robust debate about this. And so what would happen if a state in today's day and age dared to use a nuclear weapon? Um, well, while we've got you, I wondered if you also had a view uh, on the fact that um, King Charles has been told that he can't go to COP27 representing us on the world stage. Uh, the Prime Minister has said she'd rather he didn't. Do you have a thought? Well, you know, climate change, talking about threats, is the biggest threat that we face. And we did such a fantastic job at COP26. And Prince Charles, as it then was, played a pivotal role. You know, we talk about Britain's soft power. It doesn't come bigger than our royal family. And I do hope that common sense will prevail that the king will be allowed to attend. This is such an important meeting taking place, COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh in, in Egypt. I would strongly suggest that it isn't just the king that goes, but let's trust the prime minister goes as well and you know, absolutely promotes the idea of global Britain, of us using our uh, superpower, soft power status to encourage other countries to recognise this huge threat that we face. Uh Keep well. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Tobias Elwood, Chairman of the Defence Committee here in London in the House of Commons. Sir Anthony Selden, friend of the programme, is with us. You are agreeing with him. Well, I am. I, I mean, the monarchy is our greatest asset on the world stage. Why on earth would you want to uh, oppress, suppress uh, King Charles, particularly after the death of the Queen? Uh, people will be wondering, can Britain do that again with a global figure? We have that in King Charles. He's got a, a longer track record on the environment than just about any other figure on the world stage. Why on earth would you want to suppress him from speaking and reminding the rest of the world that Britain is uh, back with a powerful voice on issues that truly matter to the world? Because he might go off script? 
Well, he might go off script, uh, but we know what his script is, and therefore it'd be hard to... <laughs> we know off script is on script, uh, and it's on script for the rest of the world. It, it might be embarrassing to have the head of state upstaging the new prime minister here in Britain, but he's also a global figure, uh, and surely it's going to help Britain and also provide some, some welcome good stories for Britain at a time that, let's face it, the stories in Britain are not that great at the moment. Um, you know a lot about previous uh, mm. prime ministers. You've written about a lot of them. Um, how quickly have previous prime ministers found themselves doing U-turns? Quicker than this one? No, uh, this is uh, unusual, um, unprecedented uh, and unfortunate for Britain, not least uh, with position in the Ukraine at the moment. It's an unwelcome distraction. Uh, the growth plan that everyone agrees, or most people agree, was necessary, could have been done with greater finesse and, and subtlety. You can't just uh, come onto the stage and think that you can uh, have everybody doing things your way and rip up what previous people have done. You have to roll the pitch, uh, and that wasn't done. So the good uh, in the package, and uh, there was a great deal of good in it, has indeed uh, been damaged by uh, faulty understanding and, and, frankly, a failure uh, to understand the way that the markets and the way that the world of finance operates. Is it damaging when you have a U-turn so early on, especially when you base yourself on um, a very iron lady from, and a speech from 40 years ago, the lady's not for turning. But, but I suppose on the flip side, you could say it's a very different environment that we live in now and it is a softer approach. And if you realise that you've done something wrong, it's OK as long as you admit your mistake. Yes, and Chancellor uh, Gordon Brown came back from his uh, 10p income tax, uh, George Osborne from the pasty tax. Chancellors, I mean, neither were... Uh, as significant as this, but chancellors can come back. Uh, Liz Truss has a great asset in that the party surely cannot change yet another uh, Prime Minister and Conservative Party leader so soon. The party and the country would be up in arms. She has to show competence now. She has to avoid other mistakes. She has to build trust with the party. She has to soften her approach and show that she's listening. It may mean that uh, the Chancellor does have to go uh, and one will see when the impact on inflation, on interest rates and whether the financial plan is able to gain respect and credibility in the markets. If it doesn't, uh, then it will look bleak for him. The rules as they stand mean that she will stay in post for uh, a year. Um, unless those rules are changed. But uh, as they stand, she, she must stay in post for a year before there's any challenge to her being Prime Minister, even though she's more unpopular than uh, Boris Johnson was at any time in his premiership. Yes, I mean, we ought to remember that Theresa May recorded only 9% in the European elections, I think was the figure. So things can go catastrophically bad, even in national polls. But, look, this is the absolute nightmare for her. She uh, has wanted all her life uh, to do this and to do exactly the things that she's done. Um, and so has Kwasi Kwarteng. It's, it's um, un very unfortunate, regrettable for them on a personal level uh, that they happen to have their moment at precisely not the moment to do what it was that they did. Uh, can they row back? They're going to have to eat a great deal of humble pie uh, to show that they can empathise with uh, those who have power over them uh, and capitalise on the fact that the party cannot afford a change of uh, Prime Minister and probably can't afford a change of Chancellor. What does history tell us about previous um, Prime Ministers who've wanted to go to the country for a mandate or a better mandate? Well, uh, recently, not, not encouraging. So, um, Theresa May went in 2017 Look, every Prime Minister wants their own mandate. They don't want to be there uh, governing uh, with the, the, the credit in the bank from their predecessor. They want to show that they've got their own uh, legitimacy and claim to power and their own set of policies on which they can uh, then uh, act. Um, Theresa May tried to do that um, in 2017, uh, fiasco. But equally, Gordon Brown was blamed in 2008 for not doing that, for not getting his own 
uh, mandate rather than Tony Blair's back in 2005. Um, and that blew up in his face because uh, he ducked the moment to go for an election. So I think it just shows that being prime minister is all but an impossible office and job. Um, and uh, if you do, you're damned. And if you don't, you're damned. Uh, but she just has to, she just has to soften uh, uh, and it, it will be very painful and very difficult for her. There is no way back now. She tried to be like Margaret Thatcher. She, she tried to show that she was the Iron Lady. She now has to show that she's not just the Teflon uh, lady, uh, but also uh, the, the, the rubber lady too, who can uh, uh, bend and listen uh, uh, and go with what the party want, because they are her employers. And what does um, history tell us about previous um, yeah. governments in that, you know, we've got we've had the Tories in power now um, for 12 years. Yeah. Um, Labour generally, you know, doesn't win power. Mm. We see Tory, 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 Labour, Tory, 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 Labour, Labour potentially. And then, so will, is it a foregone conclusion that they are so doing so badly in the polls at the moment that they really are up against the ropes? Or is it for, is it, in other words, is it for Labour to lose or is it for Labour to still, still keep pushing? Well, uh, this is just the gift that uh, keeps on giving to Keir Starmer, whose own authority in the party is much more secure. Look, you never want to become prime minister at the period, at the end of a long period of ascendancy. So Gordon Brown, that was very difficult for him after 10 years of Labour in office. Same with that, shot. Same with, absolutely, with John Major taking over from Thatcher. You will get blamed, but in fact, there are many factors that make it very difficult, uh, not least the burnout of talent. And the country wants to have, and commentators want to have a fresh set of faces. Um, it, it's very difficult when that time for a change comes up. So Liz Truss, anyway, was coming on to a wicket, to use a cricket analogy, that was pretty ripped up. Uh, but by slogging uh, at the first ball that she had and being uh, caught in the gully, uh, that wasn't a great start. She can now just simply soften, soften and show competence and show she's listening. Uh, but no uh, one party has ever won since the beginning of democracy in 1832, five elections on a trot. Uh, and with that and with 25%, 30% down in the polls and with... Uh, the budget uh, so early on, such a fiasco. Uh, if you were betting, you would be a very brave person to bet on the Conservatives winning a majority in late 2024 or even January 25. Mm. Uh, your cricketing analogy will be very useful for our American viewers this yeah, morning. Thank you. Morning. I did it particularly for your American viewers. <laughs> Good morning, they love you're watching it. Exactly. Absolutely. So, uh, so um, if you had a crystal ball, your prediction would be? Uh, for the election mm. uh, that Starmer is now looking, the talk was of him being in coalition, that he'll win uh, with a majority of 30. OK, good to talk to you. Thank as you. Always, Sir Anthony. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the programme. Thank you. Quick look at the weather for you. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Next few days will bring wind and rain, but southeastern Britain looks mainly fine today. Uh, it's mild but windy now, with prolonged and sometimes heavy rain pushing across Scotland into northern England and Wales. There are some drizzly outbreaks for Northern Ireland and Ireland too. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now Liz Truss says she is going to take a responsible approach to handling the public finances amid a fresh battle against Tory rebels over the level of benefit. Earlier, the Justice Secretary Brandon Lewis told me the Prime Minister is working for the benefit of the country, despite admitting the government could have rolled the pitch better on its mini-budget. My experience of working with the Prime Minister is she tends to focus on what is right for the country and what is going to get the best outcome for people right across our country. Uh, look, we do work in a parliamentary democracy. That means we have to work with Parliament. We've got to make sure that what we are doing uh, can pass in Parliament as well. That's just a reality of a, a parliamentary democracy. Uh, look, I saw, I, I heard the, a, a clip from what Grant was saying to you earlier, and Grant was making the point, even with welfare benefits, it's about making sure that whatever you do, you're clear about what the argument is, that you can uh, show people why what you're doing is the right thing. As I say, with...
Quasi's budget was one part of that. We, need, we, we could have rolled the pitch better. We've been open about that. That's why we've moved that away. With the welfare system, as I say, the team at the Department of Work, uh, work and okay. Pensions and Chloe Smith, the Secretary of State, are working through that at the moment, and they will be making a statement on that this autumn. Check out these pictures. Women and girls being taught that not even the sky is the limit by the International Space Station's first female European commander. Here we go. Fantastic pictures. Uh, Samantha Cristoforetti took a doll made in her likeness aboard the ISS and took video questions from girls back here on Earth. She encouraged them to study science, technology, engineering and, of course, mathematics. That's fantastic. Also, um, uh, let's tell you about Ringo Starr, should we? His band have taken their show off the road after the former Beatle tested positive for COVID-19. In Mount Pleasant in Michigan last Friday. For now, though, the North American tour by Ringo Starr and his all-star band is on hold while the 82-year-old recovers. They say they hope to be back on stage very soon. Now, coming up, uh, a snapshot of the polls with a Tory peer and a pollster. We've been looking at those polls again for you. Remember, at the beginning of the week when it came to YouGov, the Conservatives were 30 points behind Labour. That was the end of last week, actually, wasn't it? And that was even before uh, the mini budget had been baked in. So uh, Labour cock a hoop about that. There have been more polls since then. On average, the Tories are between 20 and 25 points behind Labour. What does that mean for the Prime Minister? She'll be speaking to our own Beth Rigby later on uh, today. And then um, speaking to conference tomorrow, a lot of the big players, former big players, are no longer at conference this year, including David Davis.